So we are now officially recording. So hello and welcome everybody to this first ever Creativity Lab. So I'm Darren Caveney, uh, I'm gonna be your co-host for today. I'm creator of Comms 2.0 and uh, thank you so much for joining in such huge numbers. Um, we came up with the idea for this, had absolutely no idea how popular it would be or otherwise. Um, but obviously, securing the, the silky skills of the team from Doncaster will, will always help bump the attendance up. So thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, for me, I've, I've always been interested in the creative process about, and how we apply that in the world of communications, PR and marketing. You know, we, we live in a world, don't we, of strategies and plans and insights and oasis. And my fear is sometimes that the creativity gets lost sometimes. You know, and sometimes some of the best ideas don't come from a focus group or a bit of insight or some data. Sometimes it's just a good idea and you give it a go and see how it works. And I think there's lots, you know, throughout history, there's lots of examples of that. So the idea for this actually came from a really creative chat I had with, with Andy Lambert from Content Cal. Um, and actually, it was your idea, wasn't it, Andy? Andy's on the call at the moment. Andy, do you want to say hello? Well, uh, sure you might, couldn't make. I won't take too much credit for it, but um, yeah, really thrilled to, to be able to kind of put this on. Uh, I won't spend too much time talking because other people are far more interesting. But yeah, I'm Andy from, from Content Cal. I've been working with Darren on this, uh, and creativity is a particular passion of mine. If you want to find out more about Content Cal, you, you know what we're called. So it's a content marketing platform. But that is all I'll say because this session is all about creativity. But yeah. I appreciate your support on this one, Darren. No, absolutely. Thank, thank you, Andy. And so the plan is, uh, on Andy's website, there's something called Content Hub. So the plan is for today, and we've actually got a series of six Creativity Labs planned, so more on that uh, another time. The plan is to build up a real resource bank, so you know everything yeah. that we gather over the Creativity Labs will be putting onto that Content Hub. So just for the attendees of the workshop. So that you can have a look and see some of the resources. Equally, if you've got your own content that you'd like to share on there, we'll, we'll, we'll be doing that as well. So fantastic. So yeah, so Andy had this idea and I thought, why didn't I think of that? I hadn't had enough coffee that day, clearly. But so I went away, thought of a name, came up with a visual ID, um, you know, and quite genuinely, I'm not just saying this to flatter the team, but Doncaster were always top of my list for who we could get along as first guests. So I was really delighted when Steph and Liam and Nick said yes. Because um, I know they're really busy and they get inundated. And I knew a little bit about the team's work. It was about four years ago when I came up to Doncaster. Uh, seems like a hundred years ago now and interviewed uh, Rob from the team. who was in the team at the time for, for the Talking Comms podcast, just to get under the skin a little bit of the work and the creative process. And I think... Obviously, Doncaster's made a huge name for themselves with, with their brilliant work on social media. For me, they've set the, the they've absolutely set the bar for best practice social media in the public sector and beyond, actually. But you know, they're much more than just social media, and you know, it's always you know a complete team effort. So we thought today'd be really nice to get a few of the team members in and and you know and to get to get, you know, get the load down really. So as I say, thanks to Steph, to Liam and to Nick, I'm going to shut up now and go on mute and, and hand over to the team who are gonna run through a presentation for 15 or 20 minutes or so. So over to you team. Just need to, to jump in real quick. If everyone wouldn't mind just um, putting themselves if they're not talking, just on mute, if that's all right. Sorry to be that guy. And um, yeah, I, I don't mind. Uh, Sarah already flagged it in the, uh, or Sarah already flagged that in the chat. So yeah, if you wouldn't mind going on mute, just so that there's no background noise and um, sorry. And let's, let's begin. Okay, great. Thanks folks. Thanks Darren. Thanks Andy. So uh, hi everyone. Um, I'm Steph Cunningham, as it says there, Head of Communications and Engagement at the Council. And I just want to give you a quick overview as to uh, how we've got to where we are now on social media. It's been an interesting journey. Uh, it's not been an easy one, but we know social media and local government isn't always um, the best bedfellow, shall we say. So in terms of uh, how we got to where we are, so I suppose we started around about five or six years ago where we were having a conversation uh, simply around what do our comms look like? 
so I was relatively new to the team and uh, we just wanted to think about really what social meant for us, in, at, at, particularly at that time, but also where we think we needed to be. One of my mantras is probably Nick and uh, Liam will attest to this, is that I want to do, to do good comms irrespective of which sector that you're in. And I think that maybe local government comms had a bit of a sort of dowdy, grey, suited type um, reputation. And so we wanted to really sort of step outside that box and uh, spice it up a bit, if I can put it that way. So the starting point really was conversations with our then chief exec, Joe Miller. Uh, jo is a, is a great advocate of communications. She understood what we wanted to do. She gave us the permission to do that, which I know permission, you know, is a single word, but it takes a lot of hard work to get to that stage and to have those conversations and to really build a sense of trust with your chief exec on your leadership team about what we want to do and why. And I suppose we were sort of early day evangelists in explaining to them why comms were so important. Um, they see what we do in terms of press work, marketing, the usual stuff that we do day in, day out. But this new kid on the block, social media was something that we thought we could really grasp and uh, have those conversations around. So we started off uh, quite small in terms of our, our style. Uh, we did want to do something differently. We did want to be thought provoking and eye catching. Uh, and we did want to start to uh, engage people because that's obviously what social media is about. So from our perspective, uh, as I say, we looked at our personal style and we wanted to, I suppose, in a way, think differently, be more creative and try new things. And we were given what I call managing risk within creativity. So we, uh, I suppose, had the conversation around, well, we want to do something different, but we'll manage it well. Uh, we know that local government ordinarily doesn't like to take risks. So we had to build that confidence and that sense of purpose within our leadership team about, we'll take this risk, but be well managed. So don't worry, things aren't gonna get out of hand. It's not gonna be a significant issue. We'll make sure it's controlled. So there were these little stages of tests along the way, but also managing. So we give confidence to people around us. So I suppose the starting point for us, myself, Liam and Nick is that we, we I suppose at the hot house. So we're the little incubator. This is where our sort of thinking starts. And I suppose, ideally, and this might sound a bit, um, a bit twee, there we are. <laughs> that hasn't been photoshopped in any way. <laughs> One of us wasn't in the original photo, can you? Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we, we sort of started having thoughts about, well, what, what can we do that could make things quite exciting? And so, as I say, we, we start to have this, these little incubator sessions. And uh, as I say, I think from my perspective is that the stars aligned, there's no other way to put this. There isn't any magic formula. And I think it is down to our personalities. So myself, Nick uh, and Liam are slightly chatty, uh, see things differently, like to think outside the box to be quite bold in what we do. And I think having those three personalities along with the wider team, because we do obviously encourage the wider team to be part of this. I think it's just, it's just clicked. Um, and so we've built upon that. And I think my role as the head of comms is to encourage, to persuade, to sort of explain to people around us and above us that this is a good thing to do and to bring them on board. And as I say, this started with Joe Miller and this is uh, obviously developed under our new chief exec, Damien Allen, who completely understands what we want to do and gives us that permission and support to do so. Now, that doesn't mean to say there aren't any checks and balances in place. And we'll obviously explain to you how, how we work. But this is about challenging ourselves, challenging the organisation, challenging people to think differently about local government. We're very much about humour and humanity in what we do. As I say, councils previously, not now, obviously, given the, given the responses that we had to our football Super League yesterday, shows that we can be really creative, we can do something different, and we can inspire and engage people who wouldn't ordinarily want to follow a council Twitter feed. So we just wanted to try and be uh, something different and engaging, and hopefully people you know, like what we do. And as I say, we read the room, we do look at trends, we do consider uh, organically what we need to do, uh, and we aren't as rigid in how we do things. Um, so yeah, so I think it's I think it's been a team effort, but it has been a sort of caucus of of us as a as a central team. But the wider team obviously do play a big part in that as well. 
Um, so that's a bit of way of introduction. I'm sure we can expand upon this in, in our question session in a bit. So I'll, I'll hand over uh, to Liam now to take us through the next bit. So thank you. Hello, everyone. After that really good introduction from Darren, the glowing stuff from Darren and Steph, this is where the facade really crumbles down <laughs> as, as an idiot <laughs> tries to explain <laughs> what he does for a living. And because Nick is running the PowerPoint, I'm just going to clumsily Hi. point and say, next bullet point, please, as and when I need it. So um, forgive me for how unprofessional I look compared to Chris Whitty, who pulls it off very well. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what actually practically helps us to do our social and how have we developed the kind of tone and the approach that we have. Nick, <laughs> thank you. So one of our first focuses um, is that we try to focus as much as we can on short term content planning. So on the right hand side there, you have a, a screenshot from we use the website Trello, which I'm sure most of you have heard of. And what we do on Trello every Friday, Nick and I get together and we sort of plan through what's happening the next week. So Nick, if you'd like to click, we do have an eye obviously on longer term stuff. So dates that are coming up, council projects that are maybe reaching a key stage in the next few weeks, key dates. So for example, you know, from Christmas time, we've known the elections are coming up in May. So the Trello board really is just a way for us to organize all those bits and pieces that need to go out at some stage. So for example, we have a, an ongoing domestic abuse campaign that we post about regularly, maybe once or twice a week. So Nick and I really will just go through on Trello and balance out, right, what can go on a Monday, what can go on a Tuesday. Um, but aside from that, Nick, if you click, I'm just going to say click, Nick, that's quite nice. <laughs> we, we try not to get too bogged down in really long term communications plans. So this really uh, is quite a personal a personal thing for me is that I'm not the best really at maybe sticking to a comms plan or thinking that far ahead in the future. And traditionally, when I when I started my career in comms, you know, I think traditionally the way of doing things has been that we'll do a plan and we will put on that plan almost everything that we're going to do between now and November. And we can't really move from it. We'll get that signed off by everyone and their wife. And, you know, we will just stick to that rigidly. Um, and I think that actually doesn't help you in terms of being creative because I don't know about you guys, but I can't sit down and think, what am I going to post about COVID in June? We have no idea really what the world's even going to look like. And I think actually COVID has almost helped us lean into this a bit where you have to roll with the punches and you have to be quite flexible in how you work. So we really try to focus, yeah, on the short term, but keep an eye on the long term. Nick, click Nick. And uh, what that allows us to do is leave some room in the schedule. So the screenshot that is there is actually today's um, board for Trello. So four different topics it may sound like a lot, but to most local authorities, as you'll know, that's not actually that busy a day. Um, we, we can get up to 10 various different things that have to go out at different times, but just leaving you know, a bit of wiggle room in the schedule just allows us that space to be creative and if something happens or we need to change content or tweak it or something doesn't quite sit right that day in terms of what the conversation is elsewhere which I'll come on to in a second we've just got that room to kind of maneuver a little bit so I guess my first bit of advice is try not to get too hit up about you know oh my god I don't know exactly what I'm going to say in three months time I'll give you an example we've recently um, opened a brand new well, we're about to open a brand new library, museum and art gallery. It's very impressive if you haven't seen. Um, and obviously that's been a, a project that's been ongoing for months and months. And we had a virtual open event due to COVID. So from sort of January time, we've known that virtual opening was coming in April. And instead of thinking, right, so on the 3rd of March, we're going to do this post on Facebook it's this is what it's going to say on the 10th we'll do this on the 17th we'll do that myself and a couple of other people from the team went to the museum took loads of photos videos had a walk around and thought oh that statue would be really good to do something about that painting might be interesting to talk about we got all of that content and we basically said to the service 
here are a list of ideas that we will be talking about, but we didn't go into specifics about here's the day, here's, here's exactly what you can expect. And it just kind of leaves us that room to, if something's trending, we might not even realise that it's World Poetry Day, but we've got that room to think, ah, oh, that would be fantastic for that painting that we saw or that part of the museum that's about a local poet. It might work really well. So I think that mix of long term and short term actually works really well for us. Click Nick. Um, <laughs> one of the key things I think is about trust and, and Steph's already spoken about the permission that we have from senior leadership. And on a personal note, I don't just want to kiss the boss's ass in front of everyone. Obviously, I do. <laughs> um, but I think from from my perspective, one of the best things that I can say about Steph is that she really trusts the team to get on with the job. So obviously it's built up over a long time and that is kind of something that we'll touch on in a bit. But I think uh, we've built up that kind of cachet of trust now from senior leadership that they know what we're talking about. You know, they know what we're talking about. We're not going to say anything, hopefully, that gets us into hot water. But Steph has been great at actually putting what I hopefully would think as the best people in the best positions to succeed. So, for example, I'm perfectly happy to sit here in front of all of you guys and hold my hands up and say there is loads of stuff about comms I'm not actually that good at. I'm not that great at the kind of more traditional marketing side. I've had to... Um, get used in the last year to making designs and stuff on Canva and all that kind of stuff. That's just not really how my brain works. But what I do have is a, I was going to, I was literally going to just do the Liam Neeson quote. What I do have is a very specific set of skills. Um, but no, I, I'm, I'm good at coming up with content and being engaging and maybe quirky and that kind of stuff. And Steph has really put me in that position that I can do that for my job. And Nick, as well um, really just enables me to go and, and do that sort of stuff. So I think getting the best people in the best positions is really important. Click Nick. Um, and that includes sometimes accepting that you might not be the expert in that area, which can be a hard thing to kind of admit to yourself. But just as I've said, I'm not great at that traditional marketing side. It might be that social media just isn't your thing. You don't really get the amount of people that I hear say, I just don't get Twitter or I don't understand what TikTok's all about. That's fine. And just because you work in comms doesn't mean that you need to be an absolute expert on everything. But there might be something, someone on the team who does have more, more of an interest. And just by definition, I think they will work better at using that platform. Click Nick, and I'll give you an example. Um, I've experienced this myself firsthand. We've had it on the team recently. Uh, um, six months ago or so, we hired uh, a couple of graduate um, women who really have been fantastic additions to the team. They've, we've obviously a busy team. There's loads of work to do. Um, and they've been cracking on with the job. And during that time, Nick and I and Steph had been speaking about, we'd love to get counsel on TikTok because obviously it's this new kid on the block. It's the big new thing that everyone's talking about. It fits quite well with our kind of corporate tone that we can be quite quirky on there. So I had tried to make a few TikTok videos and for whatever reason, these teenagers just didn't think what I was doing <laughs> was cool. <laughs> um, even though, you know, I have no hair and I'm 30 and work for the council, they just didn't think <laughs> I was down with the kids. Um, and just by sheer chance, randomly one day, I was on TikTok myself because I, I just howl with laughter at all the videos on there. And on the front page, popped up a video from one of our graduates just on her own personal TikTok page. She'd been making these videos, not mentioned it to anybody. She's just come out of uni. I think she's 21 or 22. Her name's Amber. Um, and I just thought, oh my God, that's Amber. So I messaged her and said, you've just come up on my TikTok. How would you feel about running the council's one? Because believe it or not, I'd seen on her profile, she's got something like 15,000 followers these really gauging funny videos that she's making. So I spoke to Nick and Steph and obviously checked that they were happy with that approach and they've said, yeah, absolutely go for it. Why would I try and soldier on making these TikTok videos for an audience that I don't fully understand, as sad as I am to admit that, um, they don't seem to be quite as into watching MasterChef as I am. So <laughs> um, we've let Amber really crack on with it. 
and I don't know if you can see properly on the PowerPoint, but the second video that she posted, we had literally about five followers. She posted a video that's kind of a top trumps thing about our Gritter lorry names. And it's got 572,000 views and over 100,000 likes. And we've now got nearly 3,000 followers on the page, which is absolutely incredible and is way better than I ever could have hoped to achieve. So actually, of all the things that we've done in the last you know, year, that's actually one of the things that I'm most proud of because there's nothing more frustrating in any job when you feel like people won't let you get on with it. And I'm very lucky that I've been in the position where I've never really felt like that too many times. Sorry, Steph, I've never felt like that ever. Good, and, um, just remember. <laughs> and uh, I really don't ever want to be that person for somebody else. So the fact that we've enabled Amber and empowered her to do something that she's really passionate about, she's clearly fantastic at. She obviously sends us these videos for kind of our input, but we've never even changed anything about them, have we, guys? We've literally just let them go as she's made them. And it's successful. So that's a really good example of just enabling and empowering those people on your team to do the things that they do best and not stress if you're not the expert at doing everything yourself. Click Nick, I'm nearly done. Here we go. So again, as a person, I'm a big one for believing in um, taking inspiration from outside. And by that, I mean just outside of your own head. So it can be very daunting and quite high pressured sometimes working in comms we've all had that so many times where someone will come to us and say can you you they'll use a phrase like commsify or can you work your magic on this is something that <laughs> i get all the time um and it can be really hard to do that because obviously as a council naturally we have to talk about some stuff that is quite boring at times or is quite complicated or it's just not the kind of thing that people are on twitter or instagram to read about so it can be quite difficult to just sit there on your own and come up with these ideas. And that is why I'm a massive believer in just taking in stuff from outside and being open to being influenced by other people. So if you click, Nick, I want to make it clear what I'm not talking about is just stealing stuff from other people. I hope that we don't just nick other people's ideas all the time. But at the same time, you need to recognise there's not all the pressure on you. It shouldn't be... 100% on you or one or two other things to constantly come up with really creative and engaging stuff. You should allow yourself to be influenced by what is happening in the world, what other people are doing that you like. So it might hopefully be something we've done that might inspire you to try it yourself. There's loads of people and loads of accounts that I look at and think that's absolutely fantastic. And I really want to try doing something along those lines. So part of that is actually um, really being in touch with the public perception, public uh, conversation. And I think, as Steph mentioned in her introduction, one thing that I'm really proud that we do really well is read the room. So through COVID, we've uh, really done that brilliantly, I think, in, in terms of taking on board how people are feeling. Do people need cheering up? Do people need reassurance? Do people need someone to just say, do you know what, I'm sick of this. So for example, we did it the other week when uh, the restrictions had changed and all of those really annoying images of litter everywhere, and people going to the park and just leaving their crap all over the place. The tone that day on social media was one of just fury and frustration at the selfishness of other people. So we read the room and we went with that kind of tone and we did a very no nonsense this is pathetic, guys, please, can we do better than this kind of message? It's not always about being funny or trying to be jokey. It's about matching the tone. So if you click, Nick, one thing I think we do well is we're willing to talk about stuff that maybe other councils or certainly other public sector groups might not be willing to do. So one of those examples is a couple of months ago, the really sad case of Sarah Everard's disappearance. Um, I woke up the morning after a body had been discovered in that case and I was chatting to Nick and it was just horrible. It was an absolutely horrible news story. It really made everybody stop and think. Quite rightly, women were protesting about the fact that they shouldn't have to be second class citizens in this way and, you know, think about their safety if they just want to go for a walk. Um, 
And I just really felt like we couldn't carry on posting about the council stuff that we need to post about if we weren't willing to say something because it's what everybody's talking about. We do have a duty of care to people, obviously. Um, and if we're willing to speak out, we've done it several times in, in past years. Joe Miller, our past chief exec, was very vocal, particularly on one occasion I can remember, about council funding. She did an amazing thread that ended up getting on the Jeremy Vine show. Um, we've spoken out about issues quite a few times, littering, as I mentioned. So as an outspoken council and as a, a team that's not afraid to kind of talk about these issues, why would we not speak about something? We did a little post and a thread on Twitter about this issue, and it was one of the most successful things we've done for ages because it really matched how people were feeling. So... Yeah, just being open and being perceptive on what people are talking about and what people are feeling at that time is really important. Um, click Nick. Uh, that leads me on to my final point. My waffling is almost done. Um, you really need to follow your instincts and trust your gut as much as possible. So when I talk about inspiration from outside, I'll give you a really good example of one of the projects that I'm proudest of in my time at the council is uh, we did a campaign and call being called Binvasion. It was a few years ago. Um, it was a very hot topic at the time in Doncaster. As you can imagine, we were making changes to the waste and recycling service. Oh my good Lord. Um, people were getting a new blue bin. It was <laughs> the talk of the town and, uh, I, for months, was trying to sit down and make a comms plan about how the hell am I going to communicate this to people? We're just going to get slagged off, try and come up with that creative idea. One day, I got sent a photo from someone at the waste and recycling team of all of the new bins just lined up at the depot ready to be delivered. And my gut instinct straight away, I saw it and I just thought, that looks like an army of soldiers that are kind of ready to invade a country. <laughs> um, and I just went with that instinct. Truly, it was almost as simple as that. I spoke, obviously, to the relevant people and Steph included and just said, this is what I've thought about doing. Can I just go for it? And we went for it. And it was so, so fulfilling and rewarding. We actually ended up with people sending us photos of the bin that's been delivered on their driveway <laughs> saying like, oh, no, Doncaster Council, I've been invaded. What do we do? It actually ended up with if deliveries of the bins were late, people were happy because they hadn't been invaded yet, if that makes sense. It was an incredible, incredible project. Not to blow my own trumpet, it did win best campaign at the Waste and Recycling Awards, which is very much the Oscars of the bin world. Um, <laughs> but it all came from just following your, following my instincts and, and trusting that reaction. And I bet everybody listening today has probably said the sentence at some point in their career, oh, wouldn't it be great if we could do that? How much would you love if we could just say that? Well, I guess what we're living proof of is that you can say some of those things, obviously not all of them, but you can be more bold. You can take those risks. And if ultimately you love the content that you're putting out, then the audience will as well. And I think that's something that hopefully we've proved in the last year. So that's my little bit done. Click Nick and commence your own part. Here it is. And of course, I'm going straight in with a picture of Cannon and Ball because I've got my finger on the pulse and I'm down with the kids. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you can substitute this for any other double act, really. So if you want to put little and large in there, maybe more common wise. But basically, the point that I'm trying to make is um, when you're thinking about your messaging, whether it's in a team. So like Liam says, Liam and I will talk a lot about what we want to do on social. Steph and I will do the same. And, and you need to have that balance, I think, for the most effective messaging to work so you've got your straight man in canon usually me to be fair who will say right this is the messaging that we need to get across for that organization yes sometimes a lot of the time it's quite dry but obviously it's important it's basically what we're getting paid to do we've got that important messaging that we need to get across those key messages we need to communicate but then on the other side we've got the entertainer in bobby ball the fun side of things um thinking outside the box as Liam's already said, and trying to find those inventive, engaging ways, uh, inventive ways of engaging with the audience. Sometimes your messages are the entertainer, that's okay. 
it depends what you're trying to communicate, obviously. But the most effective messages really are the ones that find that that perfect combination between the two and kind of engage with as many of that target audience that you, you're going for and beyond as well as we've kind of shown with a lot of the Twitter stuff we do. We obviously have our target audience really of, of Doncaster residents, but then that expands as we find and channel our inner cannon and ball. So kind of from there as well, it's it's about understanding your audience, I think. And, and I've put your in capitals because obviously everyone who's on, on this chat at the minute will have a slightly different audience to us, a breakdown of the audience, but it's key that you understand what that is, what makes them tick, what they're engaging with. So then you can, you know, be more Tommy Cannon if you need to be, or be more, more Bobby Ball if you need to be. So here's a breakdown of, of our Doncaster Council's kind of um, Facebook audience, the top lines. They are ultra local. So I think it's about 80%, 85% of our um, audience on Facebook are residents. Obviously, that then means that they are interested in the transactional day-to-day -day stuff. They're, they're interested in the roadworks. And, you know, we put things out about roadworks or bin collections, as Liam said already. They're the things that will really, really engage on Facebook. Other things won't. The, the, the Bobby Ball side of things won't usually engage because we get pushback on that from those residents. So now we've got to the point where we know what is going to work on Facebook and what isn't. What isn't. Same with Twitter. So this is our, our Twitter um, audience. The vast majority are not Doncaster residents. I think it's something like 25% of our audience of over 40,000 now are Doncaster residents. They're not really going to engage with the road closures or with the bin collections because it doesn't matter to that audience. They're not interested. It means we've got more freedom to be experimental. And we can try those things like so the, the um, Super League football thread that, that went out yesterday. That's, some, that's something that wouldn't work on our Facebook. Our Facebook audience wouldn't understand that, but our Twitter audience does. So it's really about understanding, finding the nitty gritty of that audience and, and exactly what they what's going to make them tick, what they're going to engage with. And also what we found on, on Twitter as well, this is a, um, a particular approach that we've taken on Twitter. If we can make something go viral, in inverted commas viral, if it gets, if it gets good engagement, it's more than likely then going to be picked up by our local newspapers, radio stations, and potentially um, national as well. Um, we had some examples of that with, with the tweet that we put out yesterday. But then that is reaching an entirely different audience when it's in our local newspaper who don't follow us on Twitter. They won't have seen that, but they will see that we are doing things and getting that message via a different channel. So it's that secondary channel sometimes that, that we're aiming for, as well as getting the reach on Twitter. So I think we've all probably point where we've we've probably seen years of that box tick comms from the service. So the service will come to you five years ago it would have been it needs to be a press release, it needs to go in the newspaper, and now it is this needs to be a tweet. This needs to go on Facebook or telling us how to do our job. But by understanding our audience you've got the power to be able to push back and say no and explain why. So the target audience for that message. So for instance, as we've said about roadworks, we don't really put road closures on Twitter very much because we know that the audience isn't there, but we know it'll work on Facebook. So you can push back on the service and say, this isn't going to work. And here are the reasons why you're not just doing it to tick a box and keeping and that's but you also have your explanation so you're not just you know you're not just coming across like a curmudgeon by saying no we're not doing that you've got your your reasons why you're not going to do it and it's about understanding or or the service understanding their options as well for us it's not just understanding that audience on facebook and twitter it's obviously all the different social media channels it's our email mailing list sometimes we'll just send people directly to those sometimes it's just putting up something on the website sometimes it's it's traditional marketing the point really is it's okay to say no and it's okay to push back and say we don't think it should go out but it makes life a lot easier if you can then provide another option so you say no i don't think it should be a tweet but actually it'll work really well on our recycling and waste mailing list because there is your captive audience because ultimately i suppose it, your message is better having a reach of a thousand 
but the majority of those are a captive audience who are interested in that message than reaching 10 times that, but no one cares about the message. They're just having a smile at a tweet. So it's, it's finding that balance that I think we've done really well, particularly over the last year and kind of working out exactly where your audiences are and how you want to reach them. And that's it from me. So over to the questions. That's brilliant team. Really, really enjoyed that. And I've got about 50 questions of my own, but I'm not going to monopolize it. So um, we've had some questions that have come in in advance because we're all organized here, aren't we? Um, so I'll, I'll rattle through these. And whilst I'm doing that, perhaps Andy can check the chat. So if anybody wants to raise a question in the chat now, if you haven't already, put it into the chat. Just put a great big capital Q at the start, just so it's really easy for Andy to spot the questions. So I've got I've got kind of half a dozen questions here that have come in, if that's okay. So first up, uh, this is a question from Sarah Housen. Hi, Sarah, if you're on the call. So as public sector organisations, we are asked, sometimes mandated even, to share national messaging on our social channels. Do the team have any tips for how to do this while still keeping their channels fresh, interesting and engaging? Okay, so I think myself and Liam will answer this one. So Liam, you go first, I'll, I'll come on after that. Yeah, so I think um, a good example of how we've managed to do that, we did, um, we've done some historical threads in the last year on Twitter, for example, um, that are all about spreading the COVID messages, so COVID safety, staying at home, that kind of stuff. And what we've tried to do where it's possible is actually focus on what is the key thing that you're trying to get people to do. So instead of just sharing that message, what is the change that you're trying to get people to do or what is the key thing about it? So for example, with coronavirus, it was stay at home, don't do anything stupid, basically. Um, and so what I did was I then tried to think of how can we do something different with this? So I ended up Googling times when people have basically not done that. So looking up in history, times when people have done something very stupid and how can we learn from it? Um, so it's just boiling down uh, the national message sometimes to its really bare roots and finding what is the key takeaway that you want people to have. And I think sometimes that helps you to then put that message in your own style. So you are, I mean, let's be honest, there are times when we all do have to just share the, the straight national message because it's, there's no way around it. Um, but yeah, I think that's a, that's a good place to start. Steph, I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah, I think as well, I think it's about, you know, we've sort of looked at our COVID messaging, particularly on based upon behavioral science. So it's more about encouraging people to do the right thing rather than telling the things they can't do. So you flip it. So it's about giving people that you know, opportunity to make those informed decisions themselves, but not completely restricting them. So it is about the positivity of the messaging rather than the can't, you shouldn't, you, should, you know, this isn't acceptable. It's actually giving people the information to actually think, well, I can do something. I know the premises I can work in. So I'm going to make it right for me and make it safe for everybody else at the same time. So it is about thinking differently and behavioural science has become a bedrock in all of our comms, particularly on COVID. So I think it's that combination of creativity and actually going away and doing some research and thinking about the sort of science behind comms as well. Mm, that's, that's really helpful. Thanks both. And I think one of the things I've heard from kind of local government teams and NHS teams is almost when they post some of the kind of government's messages, not so much lockdown one, but a little bit of lockdown two and certainly lockdown three, they've kind of been getting the blame for stuff on social media. And I think that subtle way that you, even, even just on things like your Twitter bio, you've just got those series of lovely little phrases about looking out for each other and you've kind of localised it and you've got that Doncaster tone of voice. To it. It, just, it just is a slightly different way of doing it, isn't it? But Looks like it works from a kind of outside looking in point. Um, right, next question we've got is from Sophie Leah. Hi to Sophie if you're on the call. So you share brilliant Twitter threads that tell a story about something seemingly random and unrelated, uh, but actually they bear an important message. What's the creative process behind doing this? And how is it, how easy has it been to get the senior management team on board? So I think Liam, you've touched upon the research that you do for kind of the first element, but so, you know, some of the ones you've done, like Exploding Whales and that kind of stuff, 
what's what's the what's the kind of the approval process from there on when you've done the, the thread around it, an exploding whale? How does that work? <laughs> it sounds so crazy, doesn't it? If people don't know what you're talking about, that's <laughs> hilarious. Um, well, yeah, all these guys can can touch on it, I'm sure. But I think for for that specific example, I think what helps is that, like Steph mentioned, because the three of us are quite in tune with each other anyway. Um, very often we kind of work collaboratively on stuff anyway. So yesterday the the Super League post that we did is a perfect example really where I um, I thought, you know, again, reading the room, social media was alight with people complaining about that quite rightly. Um, so I thought I'd like to do something about it. Um, we did, I drafted a post that was along the lines of trying to make fun of how stupid this idea is by saying we're creating a, Super League of Councils. So I wrote the initial post, sent it to Nick. Nick tweaked it and actually suggested, I'd put initially that there should be a prize fund of a trillion pounds, but Nick suggested that we do a, a highways line painting machine would be the prize for the council that won, which I think is like the best line of the whole thing, basically. So he tweaked it. We sent it to Steph. She basically you really I think condensed it down and made it a lot simpler so initially it mentioned specific council services so I said there might be a pothole filling in competition for example as part of the Super League and we didn't want to get into potentially you know certain services getting slagged off by people so we took that out and honed it and then we've got something that we're all happy with so that's when it can kind of go on to other people. And I think that's where the trust comes into it, Steph. Is that right from your perspective? Yeah, absolutely. I think, no, you are. I think so. We sort of distill it down. And I suppose my role is the filter. So having the helicopter view of corporately what's happening and obviously what we think, what we need to, the sensitivity, should we say, of working in local government. So I think then it's definitely based on trust. So, you know, the fact that we've proven it to chief exec and our leadership team that you know we, we think there's something that we should we should do they trust our previous our previous work and they know our judgment is sound and then you know we've got the chief execs ultimately i went to the chief exec with this and said listen do you like this is this something that you want to go with and he said yes you know and i suppose 10 15 years ago my local government career chief exec would run 10,000 miles from something like this but the fact that he understands he gets it he understands what we're trying to do as a team and it is about us all moving at the same pace together, understanding those basic fundamentals of creativity, humour and human. And so having a chief exec that says, yes, this sounds fine, we'll go with it. Obviously, we have conversations about other things that we do. We go, actually, you know what? Maybe not now. And we do have some examples where we've put stuff together and we've all been reasonably fine with it. And But when, but when we sat away, thought about it again, had a cup of tea, came back to it, and then spoke to chief exec, we've all thought, well, actually, no, one of us isn't quite in tune here. If we're not all in tune, it doesn't go, simple as that, because we need the leadership support above us so that, you know, they can then support us if we do get any odd comments that come through on social and they see them, because obviously they are on social too, so that we're all in the same place and that we all have each other's back in a way. I mean, that sounds a bit melodramatic, but it is about building that trust over the years and having the proof to say, you know, we've done this, it takes time. This isn't something that you can actually just switch on and switch off. It's been a very long process that we've had to come up with some ideas that work, others that don't. But as I say, having that mutual understanding and trust is particularly cru crucial with social, because as we all know, social can go wrong, go wrong very badly. Um, so if you saw, you know, a, a, a brand of pizza yesterday that uh, try to piggyback on the back of the football story they were getting slated for the price they charge so it's knowing where this could go to so part of all of our roles but particularly mine is looking down those blind alleys and thinking where can this go how how will this be perceived what might we might we have to deal with if it doesn't necessarily go the way we want but as we saw yesterday the fact that the whole community of local government jumped on board this and were brilliant in their responses you know just shows that we can as a collective in terms of our sector can do this and do this really well mm. brilliant I, I absolutely loved that post yesterday it's, I, obviously i include you in all my social media training and i have to keep up that in the slides every week because you keep doing things <laughs> um 
I love the fact that you included Han Forth in that. I thought that was a masterstroke. And and then I love the tweet from Jay Rayner, kind of questioning why why he wondered why he sometimes follows Doncaster Council and now he remembers why. It's just, I think the beauty for me is it's, you're able to spot opportunities, but act upon them really, really quickly. And I think that for me is the key, because obviously if you did it three days later, kind of the moment's gone, isn't it? And I think... That, that must be a challenge, but I'm not going to ask any of my questions. I'm going to withhold myself. So there was a question that came in about how old are the team at Doncaster, <laughs> at which I think at least yes. you're, you're all very young, hip and trendy. Which Bless you, we come. Do, so. Thank you, David. <laughs> so next question. I get asked this a lot, actually, and I think um, what, what size is the team at Doncaster and who looks after social? You've kind of touched upon that, so, but it comes up ever such a lot. I think maybe maybe some people are thinking that there's an absolute army of you behind the scenes, and clearly there's not. I wish. Yeah. Um, if I go first and Nick can come in on that, yeah. I think it doesn't matter about the size of the team. I think it's about the skills you have in your team. You know, the three of us who are the caucus, and that, you know, I have other colleagues in my service that obviously support us. It's about how you work, how you click, what your ideas are, uh, you know. Um, in, in terms of you can have the biggest social media team in the world and if you aren't getting those messages that work that you're not you know, you don't have that synergy of thought that your creative processes are slow and clunky it doesn't really matter so it's quality to me as opposed to quantity but nick's got a bit more on that i think yes i've got the numbers <laughs> <laughs> um so actually 20 20 bods if you like in our in our full comms team um which is 15 ftes across all comms disciplines but actual kind of digital stroke social media, I suppose really it boils down to, to myself and Liam. And this has kind of developed over the over the years, as Steph said. So right, when, I, when I first start <laughs> <laughs> when I first started in the team four years ago now, we, we had a rotor for social media and it was like, right, I'll do Tuesday morning and you do Wednesday afternoon. And and it was spotted quite quickly as as I started and, and uh, probably more to do with Liam and, and Rob Jefferson, who's no longer with us, that, that that wasn't the way to go. And Steph picked up on that. And then we had eventually a, a kind of social media officer who worked with the whole team. And now that's been expanded again to become a digital project. So essentially, it's me and Liam working closely with Steph, but then it's offshoots of everyone. So as Liam's touched on in, in the presentation, we've got Amber doing bits of TikTok. Um, we've got our other graduate, Lauren. Uh, we have a separate COVID Doncaster page. So we set up a COVID Doncaster page with our NHS partners to give all the official COVID news. Uh, COVID news. So we did that in April of last year. So she's essentially running that now. So everyone has little bits and pieces that they do. So we've got the oversight, if you like, but everyone wants to get, get involved and we want everyone to get involved. We want people to come to us and say, I've got this great idea for a thread or a video or something. And then we will work with them to kind of shape it. So, yes, yeah, so I hope that answers it. But basically, it's a two team that then expands out to, to 20. Yeah, brilliant. Thank, thanks for that, Nick. Uh, Andy, do you want to pull out some of the questions? I see we've got quite a few in the chat. There's a lot. There's a yeah. lot. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask two. The first one kind of condensed around um, two individuals. So one from Catherine and one from Gaz. So um, firstly from Catherine, how did you win over your CEO? And expanding on that, um, I'm going to kind of put in Gaz's question, which is um, how did you overcome the political side of things? So I think they're both kind of intrinsically linked. So who wants to take that one? Yeah, I'll take that on. So in terms of winning over Chief Exec, I've said before, this is about having that good relationship at the start and having comms at your top table, which I'd like to think, you know, practically all of you have in your organisations and building upon that vision for communications. Um, everybody's an expert in comms, obviously, uh, and have their own views and viewpoint. But I think as, as comms professionals, part of our role is to be evangelists and to really explain to people why we do things and to be challenging. Uh, you know, I, I, I do have robust conversations with leadership. If I don't think it's right, then obviously I will put my point of view respectfully but forcibly. And I think in terms of how you then shape that into a, a relationship with your chief exec, has to be built on mutual trust and it has to be built on the fact that you've, you've proven what you've done and it's worked well. And that, you know, your advice is sound uh, and, that, and that you are listened to. So I think it's an ongoing relationship building process. And I think the higher you go up in comms, obviously, the more expectation that you have 
to go do that. Uh, as I say, it's about they have a shared vision. Our chief exec is very supportive. Damien understands what we do. And, you know, luckily he has the sort of same mindset in what we do on social media. So I think it's about working at the relationship. There will be ups and downs, of course, uh, but it is about making sure that you're in the right place to have those conversations. Politically, I suppose, um, that that tends to be really, um, really a conversation with the chief exec. So I attend cabinet meetings. I have regular meetings with the chief exec and we have a, we were a mayor, elected mayor authority. So I sit down with Mayor Ros and we have conversations, not necessarily so stuffy and strategic. It's about the general tone and style. And again, just really supportive in terms of uh, what, what politicians uh, want us to do and have joined in as well. You know, they retweet, they share, they make comments. So I think they know what places they can go into as politicians. And if they can join those places on wider um, council work, then that's absolutely fantastic. So there'd be no, no issues politically, but it's because we've put the legwork in first to build those relationships. Fantastic response. No, it makes a whole heap of sense. So um, following on from that, picking up on something that you mentioned around getting the CEO on side about like proving success. So um, uh, Jude has asked the question, which is the, the so what question. So, like, how do you measure outcomes? So you've got lots of people liking your tweets, uh, but potentially not necessarily residents, as you alluded to from your, your Twitter audience. Like, how do you measure? Like, what, what does success look like? How do you quantify that? Um, I'll, let, I'll let Nick and then come in. I think for me, it's about getting, it's, it's, it's a whole host of things. This is like the magic jigsaw puzzle that you take apart and you start to put things back together again. So I think for me, it's about things like this. Doncas is getting noticed for all the right reasons, you know. So I think it's about people recognising what you do, engaging with you, smiling with you, obviously. Um, and obviously humour, as I mentioned before, is a big thing being human for us. So I think from my perspective, it's, it's having that recognition, of course, um, with our own customers, with our own residents. But similarly, um, having that backing of your wider leadership, particularly, is absolutely, it's absolutely crucial. Um, but again, getting those likes, conversations, and it's about conversing social media, isn't it? It's having those conversations that people want to, and they want to engage with you rather than just flicking by you. So I think that's that's from my perspective, but um, Nick and Liam, I'm sure, have more to say on that. I think there's so many, I agree, Seth, there's so many different ways of kind of measuring success, and and we've got a few examples. So, for instance, just going from Twitter to being included in, in our local newspaper is, is one way of measuring that, that, it's been a, that the message has been a success because it's been picked up. And the reason it's been picked up is because it's had that engagement. So that's one way. Um, I think about like, and I have noticed one of the questions saying, how do you deal with negative comments? Obviously, mostly on Facebook, actually. And a way that I kind of measure how our how successful our message has been is because it's got to the point now where those comments on Facebook are usually policed by other residents. So a negative comment, we don't need to get back to that usually because another resident understands what messages we've put out and will reply to it. So, so they're policing themselves, if you like, in the comments thing. So that to me is a measure of success, but there's also just the kind of physical one. So as a quick example, um, we had some new, um, bus lane cameras put up um a few years ago now a couple of years ago we, we put out on facebook it got a massive reach reached loads of people and within a day of that post the number of people who were driving down that bus lane had gone down something like 60 percent, and then the day after it was like 50 odd percent so that we hadn't done any other comms we'd literally just put it out on facebook so that to me is a sign that clearly we've done what we needed to do and we, we've we've got that message out and it's reached the right people I guess the only thing that I would kind of add to that is from my from my personal perspective, I do sometimes get a bit maybe defensive about that whole argument of those examples of the bus lane are very few and far between where you can actually physically prove this work here has led to that. Yeah. There aren't many services in the council even that their work can literally prove we did this so that happened and residents at the end of the process change their behavior because of us but because we work in comms we're expected that that is a, a part of our work so my take on it is to not almost focus on that side of it as much sometimes and i i take the approach of particularly on twitter it's a great example and it is a really important question that 
what does it matter if these celebrities like Jay Rayner is tweeting back accounts? And ultimately, it's not anyone's collection. We do get a lot of people commenting saying they're proud to be from Doncaster off the back of it, which is a, something I'm really happy about. Um, and yeah, I think sometimes those tangible things, people who are cynical about what you're doing might use that as a stick to beat you with, but actually the, um, I'm not saying the retweets and likes in and of themselves are success enough, but they do have a value and they do lead to increased pride. People, you know, when we would, when we did the gritting stuff um, and it went massive, the, the amount of people in Doncaster who were speaking about it on posts that we weren't even involved in was fantastic. And, and if that leads to a bit more kind of civic pride, then that's enough for me, really, I think. I think if you spoke to our Visit Doncaster team as well, they they would say, because they've seen, they reply now to a lot of people saying, like Liam says about, you know, we'll put a thread out and people say, no, I'd love to visit Doncaster or whatever. So they're starting to reply now. They've picked up on it. So our Visit Doncaster team are kind of benefit benefiting from it and that people are starting to think about going to visit Doncaster and the many wonders it has. So please do visit. <laughs> I'll even make you a cup of tea. There you go. How's that? <laughs> And don't you have a new train station then? Yeah, we've got the, it's outside the train station. It's a 1930s Art Deco style, so it's listed. So the front of it has been redone, and obviously then the whole the whole sort of landscape around it has been modernised as well. So it looks pretty swanky, I would say. Mm. So, yeah. We're, we'll all be heading up there as soon as the uh, restrictions are fully <laughs> lifted. You're very <laughs> welcome. <laughs> yeah, no, it'd be great to get back. Uh, any, any more questions from the chat that have jumped out, Ander? Yeah, there's a lot of good ones. I know we won't be able to have the time to ask them all, um, but I like this one from Samantha, actually. So, sorry, I'm using my personal bias based on what questions I deem as good, so <laughs> sorry. Um, but, um, yeah, Samantha, um, any advice on how to make something memorable when humour is a no-go? That's a toughie. So I'm glad I'm not answering it. I, I mean... We've already given some examples of where um, we haven't used humour and things have gone well. I suppose it's leaning into to your voice and it's it's leaning into your your strengths and and being yourself. I think is the absolute key to anything. Don't this one thing I hate more than anything is sounding like a council. I know that sounds silly, but as soon as you put anything out like that, it's it's not going to get anything. So so be yourself and be human would be the kind of two things that I, I would say. I don't know if Liam and Steph have got anything yeah, else to add to that. From my perspective, I think um, it really it really obviously depends on what the topic is, but I think there's a clear differentiation in my head between what is an opportunity to be a bit quirkier or try and maybe be funny with it and what isn't. And it's up to maybe just accepting sometimes that some of that stuff isn't appropriate and won't work. So there's no harm in that and we do have to put out stuff. I'm not you know, none of us are sitting here claiming that everything we put out yeah. is potentially going to go viral because it's so fantastic. We do put out when the dumps are open as well. So there is no way to make, well, maybe someone on this call does know a way to make that really engaging, but sometimes you just have to accept that you you can't and there's no pressure on you to make that a fantastic Facebook post because it, you know, it is quite a dry subject so yeah it's just it's picking your moments isn't it don't don't overthink as well like like we've said about the the kind of understanding your audience on, on facebook if we you know the the hdrc is a really good example liam we don't we don't overthink that we just give the information because we know that everyone <laughs> everyone's interested in it same with bin collections we don't have to overthink it here's a picture of a bin here's the information you need to know and here's a link to the website that's it and it will reach 30 40 000 people no worries so we Sometimes you don't have to overthink as well, I think, and, and it, it goes back to that understanding the audience and, and keeping it simple where you need to. Mm. Yeah, just coming on that as well, I totally agree with Neem. Like, I think it is about simplicity. So it's not trying to sort of overgild the lily. But similarly, you know, if you've got a good design, a good Canva that can actually, you know, sort of say what you want to achieve or get people to think, then I think that that works just as well. So it's really, you know, what is the message? How simple can you make it? And then how can you bring that to life? And if you can't, just go with it. It's not worth it. It's not worth you know, getting so stressed about something that really isn't going to resonate particularly in the way that you want. So just get it out there. Try it. Just try different different ways of doing things and see what works. Yeah. 
There was that really nice example you had as well, wasn't there? I think this was lockdown one. It was when young people were the latest to start being blamed for everything. And you did a short little thread because some kids had been using a skate park. And, and, and it was quite a serious post, but your tone of voice was kind of trying to be a kid and you almost spoke, you know, I think you used the phrase gnarly and I think you said like, yeah, the, man, yeah. the man is telling us not to do this. And that yeah. for me is, you know, it probably wasn't one of your ones that went viral, but it's a brilliant example to answer Andy's question that you can, you can just simply with the tone of voice do it in a slightly more interesting way rather yeah, than... Yeah, so, yeah. so for example, a, another one of those would be um, if we, we did one the other day that was about fly tipping and we really lent into the fact that if the council was a person, that person would be really into talking about fly tipping legislation. So we'll, we'll go about it and we'll talk about it like it's the most exciting thing in the world. And people, people do respond to it. So we did uh, one a couple of months ago that was... I think it was section 108 of the you know like legislation on fly tipping but make it a movie and we did it about it was like the we did it like the plot of a film um and so yeah sometimes it's leaning into even saying this next post is going to be quite boring guys but we have to do it here it is that's human and that is how people talk and there's no harm in being open to doing that yeah yeah, no, I love it. It's a really good example. I'm not sure if she's still on the call, but I think Lisa Potter up in Scotland had had a hand up. So Lisa, feel free to uh, to shout and uh, put your microphone on if you wanted to uh, ask that question. If Lisa isn't still on the call, uh, Andy, any others that are jumping yeah. out? I think um, yeah, as we're kind of at the top of top of the hour, the questions are starting to to dry up a little bit. But this one, I think, is probably quite a nice finisher, which is what in particular I, in terms of your social media content are you most proud of and that's from from laurie oh that's interesting who wants to go first um i think for me i think it, i think for me it's actually what the what the outcome has been of our social media so as much as social media what we've done has been fantastic we've had amazing you know we had 89 million reach last year which is phenomenal for the council so I think it's about the, the outcome of that. So people think about us differently. Uh, they want to engage with us. Um, you know, they want to talk to us about things and that people hopefully will recognise Doncaster Council beyond our boundaries. So I think for me, it's what is the result of what we're doing, uh, as well as obviously hopefully keeping our residents informed and up to speed and, and they engage with us and get what they want from us. So I think that's it from, from where I'm sitting, but I'll see what Liam and Nick say. You want to go, Liam? Yeah, I think for me, I'm a big fan of when things take turns that you didn't expect them to necessarily take. So yesterday is a great example of other councils really getting involved in what we posted. I really enjoyed that. But one of them, um, the Exploding Whale thread that I did last year, obviously that was a, a massive one and went really properly viral. But the, it ended up with the actual place in America where they blew up the whale they have named their park the Exploding Whale Memorial Park after having seen our thread on Twitter. And the idea that a, a park in Oregon has a name like that because of a tweet that we randomly just put out on a Monday morning, I think that is absolutely amazing. So that is, it's a bit pithy, but that is my one, I think. Um, there's a couple for me as as because I kind of work more on the the overview across the, the the digital stuff. So for me, the way we've managed to kind of understand our audiences a lot better and 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 work out what messages are going where, so we're not just blanketing everything across Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or whatever, which we were doing initially. I'm quite proud of that that we've managed to to work out where our audiences are, and we can really. Um, really reach them hopefully a lot better I think of a message that we um, we posted a, a short video of barry from eastenders singing uh, remind me of the song liam something inside so strong. something inside so, singing something inside so strong live at an indoor bowls championship and essentially it was the line we're going to do it anyway repeated four times and I'd, I'd seen that a few days before talking about, I'm, I'm a Leeds United fan, talking about how Leeds play football and uh, basically saying, 
you can't you can't turn up at the Premier League and play football like this. And then the video was, we're going to do it anyway. So I messaged that to Liam and said, we've got to do something with this. I've just laughed so much. So in the end, we came up with, let's promote the TikTok. Because obviously people don't think a council should have a TikTok for whatever reason. We're not going to, re- the audience isn't there. So that's the way we went with that. And I've d- it just made me laugh so much that I'm, <laughs> I'm quite pleased with that one. <laughs> Brilliant, great great examples. And um, yeah, I mean, mindful of your time because you've got jobs to do and things, haven't you? And you've got got things to make go viral this afternoon. So (laughs) we're we're just, uh, but I think testament, there's still nearly 90 people on the call. And I think that's testament to all the work that you do. And thanks so much for, for kind of taking the time today, for sharing kind of, you know, how you do it. Uh, I knew a little bit, but I've learned lots today as well. Andy, any any final thoughts from you before we depart? Uh, no, I just want to say as um, well, a massive thank you for everyone putting their time in. That was an excellent presentation. I sit through lots of social media oriented presentations, but like like this real life example stuff, so so valuable. And and for me, the the top Trump um, TikTok example, absolute genius. I flipping love that. Um, yeah, so yeah, you've well impressed me. It's very engaging. So just to thanks. sorry to interrupt, Andy. Just before we go, that we, so we did those top trumps a year before as well. So so Amber had picked up on the fact that we'd done it a year before and then used them in a TikTok, which I think is probably even more impressive that she's picked yeah. up on something we've done already and then made it into to something completely new. So yeah, she did a great job. Brilliant, it's brilliant. So listen, thanks everyone who's joined today. I hope it's been useful. Uh, obviously today is the first Creativity Lab, but Andy and I have got more planned. Season one should feature, we think, six. So if you've got ideas for who you'd like to hear from, just drop us an email. We've got a few ideas as well. We've got some really interesting people lined up. But yeah, just a kind of a virtual round of applause for Team Doncaster. Thank you so much for your time. We love you. Darren, can I just ask, are we doing the customary awkward wave at the end of a Zoom call? Yeah. Is, that, <laughs> oh, yeah. is that how these are all going to end? <laughs> let's, let's do a great big wave. Don't have to. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Have great afternoons, and we'll see you all again soon. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.